Uh, thank you to all the attendees joining us. I just wanted to let you know that we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll start the event at 10 o'clock. Uh, so it is 10 o'clock and we will get started. Um, good morning. Thank you to everyone for joining us in this uh, virtual webinar. Um, today's topic is going to be the future of the versatile test reactor, a key player in the nuclear energy innovation ecosystem. Uh, today we have three speakers with us. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them to you. We have uh, Judy Greenwald, who is the executive director of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. We have Jackie Topp, who is the deputy director for the Good Energy Collective. And we have Jennifer Gordon, who is the Managing Editor and the Senior Fellow at Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Today's event will begin with uh, three brief introductory remarks from the speakers, and then we'll proceed into a moderated discussion, after which we'll have an open Q&A. Uh, at any point, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, so since we've gone through the introductions, Judy, uh, please feel free to begin with your remarks whenever you are ready. So am I going first or is Jackie going first? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you saw you're right, Jackie. Uh, please feel free to go ahead. That was my mistake. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Brian. And, and many thanks to the, the Global America Business Institute and to Judy and Jennifer at the Nuclear Innovation Alliance and Atlantic Council for co-hosting this webinar and for all of your continued education and support on the Bristol test reactor issue. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Jackie Toth, Deputy Director of the Good Energy Collective, uh, we're a progressive research organization articulating socially grounded policies for advanced nuclear uh, to help these reactors work for the people and communities they're designed to serve. Uh, but we, we don't get to a point where that happens uh, until we uh, you know, develop the regulatory pathways, safely license these reactors, provide for the fuel necessary to power them, and build out the research capacity through a VTR to assess and improve the systems, sensors, fuels, and other material of new nuclear. Now, companies, universities, and other groups across every industry uh, look to federal spending bills for assurance. Congress zeroing out VTR in its fiscal 22 spending bills is already having consequences. Some VTR project staff are starting to say, you know, I now can't count on job security in this role. Falling behind on VTR funding in line with this administration's DOE budget request unnecessarily risks pushing the VTR operability date further down the line and into the 2030s, all while advanced nuclear developers, both domestic and international, could benefit from this test capacity much sooner. The infrastructure package that President Biden signed into law last month contains nearly two and a half billion dollars support the cost shared demonstration of two domestic advanced nuclear developers first reactors and that's positive but support for private companies should not be provided to the exclusion of the kind of public use infrastructure like the VTR that benefits a wider set of innovators researchers and allied countries by the most recent count already the VTR project is supporting a broad group of scientists and experts on a leading edge infrastructure project from six natural lab, national labs 
nearly 20 universities from across the country and around 10 industry partners. At Good Energy Collective, we want to see more federal investment in public infrastructure for nuclear and in projects and programs that support bright minds in learning how to make nuclear safer, more efficient, and more exportable. Developing a fast neutron testing capacity doesn't come cheap. This is the type of impactful infrastructure project that our government is primed to support. And it's not as if this project would be built in a vacuum with no benefits for the expense. Setting aside for a moment the pollution reduction, local and climate benefits that you get from an energy mix with more nuclear supported by the VTR. Administrators of the test reactor could assess fees on users and allied nations who want to perform tests. When we're already investing billions in other core pillars of advanced nuclear, lagging on VTR will only delay a nuclear developers' ability to test and prove new reactor components and keep innovating. VTR project developers are doing their part right now to look for and incorporate efficiencies. The demonstration of TerraPower's natrium reactor targeted for 2027 offers an opportunity for learning and risk reduction by timing the construction of the VTR to follow natriums. De-risking any large project like this is a welcome development and should give lawmakers confidence that the Energy Department is serious about developing a fast neutron source as Congress has directed it. However, it is not possible to combine the natrium and VTR builds into one. These two projects have completely different end uses and goals. We're depending on Congress and the administration not to lose sight of the public infrastructure investments they still need to make to foster a strong domestic advanced nuclear industry. And we're hoping that the nonprofit nuclear and climate community will continue to make a strong case for the VTR whenever others whether in Congress or in industry, do not. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your remarks, Jackie. Um, Judy, please feel free to begin. Thanks so much, Brian, and thanks to our partnering organizations and our uh, viewers today for joining us to talk about this really important issue. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Nuclear Innovation Alliance or NIA, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan think and do tank, and we're working to create the conditions for success for advanced nuclear energy to be a key part of the climate solution. Through research, analysis, and education, we inform decarbonization and innovation policy. We've played a leading role in informing major federal legislation to reform advanced reactor licensing at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and to expand the Department of Energy's nuclear innovation efforts. We also collaborate with stakeholders to coordinate advanced reactor advocacy in the United States. I'd like to say a little bit about why VTR is so important. Fast neutrons and fast reactors are important because they could let us more effectively use nuclear fuel and could shorten the amount of time that radioactive waste is dangerous. We need the VTR because we need to be able to test the impacts of fast neutrons on fuels materials and components that will be used in advanced reactor designs. Historically, the US has always been a leader in the development of nuclear technologies. We have over 18,000 years of operating experience with thermal or slow neutron reactors compared with only hundreds of years of operating experience with fast neutron reactors. Currently, the only commercially available fast neutron testing facility is in Russia. There's no commercial fast neutron testing capability in the US. By creating the VTR as a national testing facility for advanced reactors, advanced fast reactors, the US government and industry can provide the data and analysis needed to accelerate their design and construction. Over the past 20 years, nuclear power performance has improved tremendously, and it's now the most reliable energy source in the United States. Test facilities like DOE's Advanced Test Reactor, or ATR, at the Idaho National Laboratory have provided technical data and insights to qualify new components and methods to ensure the continued safe operation of existing nuclear power plants. Since 1967, the ATR has played a key role in US nuclear energy research initiatives and programs. But the ATR only uses thermal neutrons and would not be able to replicate fast neut neutron reactor conditions. 
DTR will support progress in advanced nuclear energy by testing and qualifying new types of advanced nuclear fuels and innovative structural materials, testing innovative components and instruments, validation of advanced modeling and simulation tools, and providing a flexible test pl platform that can be configured to meet future research and development challenges. I'll just say a bit about the recent history and state of play of the VTR, just to elaborate a little bit on what Jackie covered. In September 2018, the Nuclear en Energy Innovation Capabilities Act, or NECA, was signed into law. NECA directed the Department of Energy to decide whether a fast neutron source for new advanced reactors was needed for the next generation of nuclear reactors. Congress set aside $35 million in 2018 and $65 million in 2019 for the fast neutron project. In February 2019, DOE formally announced that the national laboratories will be moving forward with development of a conceptual VTR design. And then in August 2020, Bechtel, TerraPower, GE, Hitachi signed a contract to help design and build VTR. Then in December 2020, the Energy Act of 2020 was enacted authorizing $348 million for BTR and FY22. And then in August, 2021, the House and Senate Appropriations Committees set aside $0 for BTR for FY22. And then in November, 2021, just last month, an interim draft of the House Build Back Better bill appropriated $95 million for BTR for FY22, but the bill that passed the House did not include any BTR funding. As of December 2021, where we are here today, we're now waiting to see what the Senate does to build back better over the next few weeks and in regular appropriations in early 2022. Uh, thank you for those remarks, Judy. I definitely want to circle back to the urgency and the need of the VTR, but before we do, we have uh, the final remarks from Jennifer. Thank you so much, Brian. And I also want to thank Gabby and Florence Low Lee for her leadership, especially on nuclear innovation and on this issue of the VTR specifically. Um, I'm Jennifer Gordon and coming from the Atlantic Council, um, I wanna kind of give a broad overview and kind of the, the 30,000 foot view um, of some of these issues and why, why we're talking about nuclear innovation and why I believe that this is so important. Um, We've talked about the emerging markets for nuclear, and I believe that a conservative estimate is that that market could triple globally um, by 2050. And of course, I think all of us here agree that we absolutely need an increase in clean energy technologies to address the climate crisis. Now, if that were all that this was, it wouldn't really matter which country or countries were manufacturing these this set of clean energy technologies. However, we're talking about nuclear energy. So in fact, it does matter and it has to be led by the United States and of course also by our allies because that's the way in which we ensure that the highest standards of safety, security and non-proliferation are upheld as we hopefully deploy more and more nuclear energy technologies throughout the world over the next several decades. Now, what does US leadership actually mean? It means that we need to have a strong civil nuclear export program, again, in concert with our allies, because it's very difficult to export something that you're not actually making. So this is where I think we get to a sense of the nuclear energy innovation ecosystem. And you know, there's been a lot of focus, and I believe rightfully so, on the demonstration programs and on making sure that we demonstrate the next generation of advanced reactors. Um, that said, we absolutely also need the fuel because otherwise it could be like a car, an internal combustion engine car sitting there without gasoline. And we also, of course, need the versatile test reactor because that is the technology that ensures that the next generation of nuclear energy technologies does not become the last generation of nuclear energy technologies. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Back to you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to all of the speakers. Um, just wanted a quick reminder to all the attendees that we have a Q&A box at the bottom. Please feel free to enter your questions as we go through the moderated uh, discussion. We'll also have an open Q&A afterwards. So uh, I was struck by the urgency and the need. I wanted to discuss the urgency and the need of the VTR. Um, Judy, you touched upon this, and uh, Jennifer, you also kind of briefly uh, discussed this as well. I uh, kind of wanted to go over, the, I guess, the broad the U.S.'s need for uh, SMRs and advanced reactors. Uh, this is kind of the main 
uh, discussion point of the VTR. And I was wondering if we could discuss kind of um, why do we need these advanced reactors? Um, if the US seeded this nuclear leadership, what, what would it look like in the future? And I guess um, to hit Jennifer's point, could climate change goals be met without nuclear reactors? I guess these are all kind of questions I'm hoping we can kind of discuss to kind of portray the need and the urgency of the VTR. Uh, right, maybe Judy, if you want to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Judy, would you like to? I think I'll start uh, on the climate need and maybe Jennifer can pick up more on the security, uh, international security needs. So we definitely need a lot of clean energy in order to meet our climate goals. And there's been a lot of modeling analysis that indicates that it's a lot easier and perhaps it, it's only possible if we include nuclear energy to meet our climate goals. It is, we have seen scenarios where we potentially meet goals without nuclear energy, but it makes it very, very difficult. And so if we really, if it's important to us to meet our climate goals, which we think it is, we really need new nuclear energy. And um, you know, countries that have nuclear energy can meet their climate goals much more easily. And we're definitely, we need it to meet our climate goals. And so one of the things that um, nuclear brings to you is that it's firm capacity, it's capacity that you can rely on. So having nuclear energy as part of your energy system is really important. It doesn't mean that you would necessarily need to rely completely on nuclear energy. We can have a mix of energy sources. And in fact, that would be the most uh, robust and resilient approach is to have a mix of clean energy sources to meet our goals. But we definitely need nuclear energy. We certainly have benefited from it in the past. It's now about half of all of our clean electricity comes from nuclear. And we expect that going forward, we will be able to do much better and be able to meet our climate goals as we have advanced nuclear energy. Um, one key advantage of advanced nuclear energy over existing is that we think that it can have lower costs. And this is because you, you're gonna be able to build these reactors in smaller increments. And that makes it easier to invest in them, to finance them, and it makes it easier to match them with your growth in electricity demand. So having these, this sort of new generation that comes in these smaller increments makes it much easier to um, meet our energy needs over time. Thank you. Um, Jackie, did you want to weigh in on this as well? Oh yeah, just to piggyback, Judy covered that, that perfectly, I think. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of why, uh, why advanced nuclear, you know, we've seen in the last, you know, decade or two, you know, utilities kind of eschew new large um, thousand megawatt nuclear nuclear builds, you know, as, as uh, both gas and renewables uh, got progressively cheaper as demand kind of plateaued following the, the Great Recession. Um, but, but the new set of, of advanced uh, reactors offers a lot of new, new assets that, that utilities are, are taking a second look at now um, in terms of um, how nuclear can fit into their, uh, their portfolio. Um, you know, Judy obviously mentioned the potential reduced costs, and uh, you know, um, there are a lot there are the passive safety uh, benefits that you might assume, and more efficient uh, use of the fuel. So uh, this is why we see uh, additional interest uh, in nuclear again. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Uh, Jennifer, I was hoping you can discuss a little bit, expand a little bit more on the geopolitics, kind of uh, the nuclear leadership in the U.S., uh, but also I. I also wanted to touch upon the point that some countries like Germany are phasing out nuclear due to safety. Is this something that uh, advanced reactors could address? Thanks, Brian. So to go to your first question, I mean, I think this really, to me, gets back to, first of all, making sure that the United States, which by the way, I believe at this moment, we do have the advantage in advanced nuclear technologies, but we want to keep that advantage. And so if we're competing, against Russia and China, and if they have those testing facilities, and if we give up the opportunity to have that type of fast neutron um, testing facility, then we're not gonna win. We're not going to be able to, to develop and deploy the best next generation of advanced reactors. So, so we absolutely need that ability. Um, in, at the moment, we actually have a situation where the US nuclear energy industry if they want to use that type of facility, they either have to go to Russia or they face getting shut out of Russia. So 
I don't think that anyone who supports a, a domestic nuclear energy industry and a, a robust nuclear energy industry wants to have that situation. Um, Brian, I know you asked a second question. Can you remind me quickly? Oh, yeah. So uh, kind, of, kind of going along with the geopolitics of nuclear, I, uh, I was wondering if you could discuss maybe the potential of these advanced reactors to address maybe safety concerns for some countries who are looking to phase out nuclear. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that when you look at nuclear energy technologies, whether it's the current, you know, existing fleet of light water reactors or the next generation, it is safe, it is secure. Um, I think that, you know, if you look at a country like Germany that's, you know, chosen to phase out, I mean, I think that that decision is sort of made a little bit separately, I would argue. Um, and, you know, they're going to have to come to terms with a choice that has now forced them to rely even more on coal. Um, and that's, I, I think, a political, you know, that's that's a policy issue. Um, I do think, though, getting back to some of what Jackie and Judy were mentioning earlier, that you have emerging countries, new to nuclear countries, that, you know, perhaps because of their situation with, you know, their own grids um, and grid stability, they wish to have either small or even micro reactors um, and, you know, building a traditional light water reactor fleet just doesn't make sense in emerging, in some emerging market countries. So, you know, I think that, but I would again stress that anything built by the United States and our allies is safe and is secure. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so, can I, I mean, can I just yes. follow up on what you were talking about when people um, decide to phase out nuclear? I mean, the consequences sure. of deciding to phase out these plants earlier in every instance in which this has occurred is that greenhouse gas emissions go up. So it is just, um, you have to face the fact that we need it uh, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So if you're worried about the climate and you wanna decarbonize as rapidly as possible, getting rid of your best source of zero carbon electricity just doesn't make sense. And we just have to face that fact. And then we have to make sure that the plants are as safe and as secure as possible, which I think we do a really good job of. We have to continue to do that. That has to be a core part of what we do in this space. But we have to recognize the reality that we need these plants to meet our climate goals. Yeah, I strongly agree. And then also given the advanced reactors and the SMRs, the kind of the improved siting options can also just further help with the clean energy push. Um, I kind of, so moving on, I kind of wanted to uh, move into the uh, more topic on the VTR. Uh, could we discuss kind of the current status of the VTR? Uh, what is the current state of the um, project? Uh, well, I guess what is currently happening right now? Jackie, if you want to um, fill us in a little bit. Sure, yeah, happy to do that. Um, so in December, excuse me, uh, September 2020, uh, DOE formally approved what's called critical decision one. Uh, this is a project management uh, term from the agency. Um, and up to critical decision one, uh, that this is when the very early design work uh, was performed on, on the VTR. Um, as part of uh, CD1 concluding, we're, you know, we're still waiting for the release, um, a formal release of an environmental impact statement. So a lot of folks on the call will know that under the National Environmental Policy Act, um, the federal government uh, needs to uh, analyze the potential environmental consequences of large uh, federal infrastructure projects. Um, we, we anticipate that would likely be released uh, in the early part of 2022. Um, so now the project is currently in uh, the engineering and, and design phase and, and a cost and schedule baseline is, is under development. But I, I should stress that, you know, in order for the, the VTR to continue on a path toward eventual uh, approval of CD2 and beyond, um, it, it needs sufficient funding uh, to advance the project and uh, addition, additionally to capitalize on, on any, any synergies with the, the Natrium demonstration. So uh, things are, are moving forward still currently, um, but we're hoping that Congress will recognize that uh, you know, eventually the project may hit a wall without additional support. I see. Uh Judy and Jennifer, um, could you maybe discuss, do you see any prospects for the nuclear industry to expedite any of these um, pro progresses for the future? I know we're kind of waiting on the funding aspect from Congress, but is there anything that we at the nuclear industry can do to, I guess, expedite this or kind of catalyze this? So Brian, I would say, you know, I think conversations like this one um, are extremely important for kind of raising awareness, um, educating and informing, whether it's policymakers and other decision makers in the public. Um, I think we just need to keep 
you know, raising um, awareness of, of this set of issues. And also, I think to get back to that ecosystem view again, I think that as the, the NGO community, which I think we all here as speakers um, and you, Brian, as well, represent, um, you know, we have the luxury of not being forced to prioritize and to say, you know, I think this piece of the innovation ecosystem is more important than this other piece. We can step back and we can say, actually, it's all important. The US government, you know, should seriously consider funding all of it because we actually need each of these technologies. They each fulfill a different role. Yeah, I wanted to uh, pile on on that. Um, so to get advanced reactors to be in the position where they can play a role in um, solving climate, it requires a whole of society effort. It requires NGOs, uh, rest of civil society, the companies themselves have to make sure that they have a product that is technically uh, safe and cost effective and financeable. We need in private investment and we need public investment. The VTR is an example of the piece of this whole of society of effort that we really need the federal government to step up on and because it's essentially a public resource. Um, all of these early developers could use this public resource to test components and then there's public benefits from doing those tests on components that, that we can all reap. Uh, there's a lot of act, aspects of innovation that has to be done by individual uh, private companies as they pursue designs, but having this public testing resource that benefits everyone and moves the ball forward is really important. And this is a very core component of what we need DOE to do. Um, I, I agree. Is there is there any opportunity for per se international funding? Because uh, as you mentioned, Russia seems to be the only other country with this type of fast neutron testing capability. Uh, if the US were to develop the VTR, it, I imagine it would benefit some of our allies as well. Um, are there opportunities for, I guess, international funding? So my understanding is that yes, there are opportunities for international cost sharing. However, and this is what I think is really crucial, our international civil nuclear partners and allies are not going to help fund construction costs. And they need to see that we are truly serious about this project before they make any commitments of their own. I, I understand. Um, in, in that sense then, are there any plans? So I guess uh, utilize the VTR as a uh, user facility to private industry and partners, I guess, to help generate revenues? My understanding is that the VTR could be used um, to as a user facility and assess some fees on uh, private developers and, and allied nations for, for that work. I see. Um, so I kind of wanted to move on to, um, I guess, the gaps that the VTR could fill. So uh, we mentioned that there is the advanced test reactor at INL, and we also have the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, could you discuss a little bit about how the VTR can provide capabilities beyond these existing test facilities? Um, I'm happy to take that, that first. Um, so with the advanced test reactor at Idaho National Lab, um, what, what that test reactor is able to produce are uh, th th thermal neutron irradiation. So if you're thermal, think slow. Um, the ATR is uh, capable of performing um, tests on materials for advanced nuclear. Um, it's, a different, it's a different case matter for, uh, for fuels. So uh, with regard to materials, um, in one particular spot of the ATR, um, it is capable of uh, achieving what's called 10 displacements per atom per year, um, which uh, in the VTR, in multiple areas, you could achieve what's called 30 displacements per atom uh, per year. Um, how that manifests is a, a, a test that would take three years in the ATR for advanced nuclear materials uh, could take as little as one year in, in the VTR. This is particularly important uh, when you consider that the ATR is already oversubscribed. Uh, more uh, organizations, uh, testers want to want to perform tests at the ATR than, than is currently possible. Uh, for fuels, however, totally different story. Uh, you really do need fast neutrons that uh, VTR would uniquely provide uh, to be able to test the fuels that, that would go into advanced reactors. There's no correlate. I see. 
Um, that kind of segues a little bit. There are some uh, audience questions that I kind of wanted to bring into this. Uh, uh, there's a question from the audience. The most recent U.S. fast neutron test reactor was a fast flux test reactor uh, test facility. Having trouble hearing you, Brian. Can you? Oh, sorry. The it? question is: the, the most recent U.S. fast neutron test reactor was a fast flux test facility, which was closed because it was considered too expensive to operate uh, at about $80, $80 million dollars per year in the late 1990s. The VTR would be about the same size. Would it cost about the same as the FFTF to operate? And this is a audience question from Mark Holt. Um, I guess, yeah, Jackie, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I'm, I'm less familiar with that, that earlier project. Um, I would just say that the, the cost calculations for the VTR uh, are still ongoing, in particular as the, the DOE uh, newly assesses some of the synergies that may exist, um, some learning that can be done from um, in support of the, the natrium uh, demonstration project as well. Uh, the anticipation is that uh, by slightly following uh, the natrium's uh, development, uh, there would be some eventual cost reductions uh, overall to the VTR project, uh, but I can't speak to that, that former reactor specifically. Yeah, I, I don't know the specific cost comparison, but I do know that over the past, um, certainly decades and also more recently, there's been enormous innovation in materials and information technology and sensors. And just a lot of this innovation really changes the cost structure of a lot of these technologies. So it's really important when you look at past costs for any of these technologies that you take into account that it's it's a new day. I mean, it's a little analogous to batteries. You know, batteries are really, really old technology, but recent advances in sensors and materials have been game changers in terms of the cost of batteries. And then they become much more cost effective in applications that they might not have been in the past. So what's very exciting, and that's what's happening now with advanced nuclear technology, is that we're seeing all these advances that are very promising and really game changers and change the calculus from what we've seen in the past about how things can perform, the quality of the materials and their costs and fuels and all of the aspects of the components and the whole supply chain. I see. Um, well, there was a, um, we discussed the, the, brought up the idea of the Natrium project and there is a question about this Natrium project that I wanted to bring up and that the VTR and the Natrium project are both gonna be using the GE PRISM reactors. Are there potential problems in trying to build both at the same time? Yes, there are a lot of problems with that, um, and it's not possible. Um, the, the natrium demonstration is specifically um, for the demonstration of a electricity generating reactor, um, while the VTR uh, will never put any electricity onto the grid, uh, strictly a test reactor. Um, and as, as an extension here um, of, of this is that, um, you know, TerraPower is, is working to demonstrate what its uh, marketable product might look like. Um, there, there is no world I can envision in which, um, you know, in, de in the development of this uh, demonstration project, they would want to add, uh, you know, test loops uh, to the facility. I see. Um, well, I kind of wanted to go through one more, I guess, moderated question before I kind of run through this uh, audience Q&A. And I kind of want to discuss the synergy of the VTR with the ARDP, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Project. Um, so my understanding is that the VTR and the advanced, the ARDP are going to kind of uh, work together on this. Uh, could we discuss kind of the timeline of the VTR given the ARDP and how they will line up? Uh, will we have these technologies in line together to, I guess, uh, see this advanced uh, reactor industry that we're hoping to achieve? Um, Jennifer, so, maybe if you want to know. Yeah, on. sure. So, you know, it may well be that the ARDP actually brings its reactors to demonstration before the VTR is built and ready. Um, and the thing is, as long as we remember that the ARDP, that those demonstrations are not the last demonstrations of advanced reactors, that's completely fine. Um, the VTR is meant to continue to help innovate, um, both in the fuel and the materials for advanced reactors, for generations, for, for, for decades and decades going forward. So it's you know, perfectly fine that we would have this ARDP, you know, the, this first set of an advanced reactor demonstration 
and then have that followed by continued innovation, which is enabled, of course, by the BTR. I see. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, are there, are, great. Um, yeah, I'll just ahead, add, I mean, the, the best the best analogy I've heard um, applied to the, the use case for the, the VTR is, you know, if you look at your cell phone today, how different it looks from from the flip phones of, of 10 years ago. Um, you know, the VTR is is a, a, a long term uh, innovation play so that you know, the advanced reactors of today can innovate uh, and you know, be even more efficient going forward. Um, this, this is the rationale. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'll elaborate on that too. So I think sometimes we think about um, climate solutions and just innovation more broadly as that like you do it once and then you stop. And really what has to happen is that we need to start as soon as possible, uh, probably yesterday would have been better, uh, solving our climate problems through lots of technology innovation, including through advanced nuclear and then we have to keep innovating because the need for electricity and energy more broadly doesn't stop. We have to keep uh, making sure that we have clean energy that we can replace over time. We have a world full of people who need energy and there's just gonna be growing need for clean electricity and energy more broadly over time. And we need to keep getting better and better at this. And it just has to be an innovative process that continues over time. And Brian, if I can jump in one more time, and Jackie, I loved um, the cell phone analogy. Um, I think that's pretty clear to all of us uh, who, who grew up with flip phones or even before. Um, you know, I think this is a lot like the first generation of light water reactors that was built in the 1960s to demonstrate the concept. Um, and then through technologies like the ATR, those first set of LWRs continued to innovate. And so now we have today's light water reactors. So, you know, this is the ARDP really is how, how do you demonstrate a first of a kind, but if you want to continue to innovate and to use another analogy, um, you know, you don't want to be the company that, that deploys, um, you know, Betamax and is the first thing, but then suddenly becomes out innovated or out competed um, by the companies, you know, by by VHS um, and you know, let alone CDs and everything else that continue to innovate. I understand, but uh, for the past the ARDP demonstrations for these advanced reactors to be commercialized, at some point we we're going to need the VTR to, uh, I guess, test some of these things. So, uh, I guess my question is. Uh, what is the latest timing that we can hope for this VTR? I guess, what is the timing urgency for this VTR? Even after we have the first uh, round of demonstrations, I guess if we wanna reach these uh, goals to commercialize advanced reactors, uh, how quickly do we need this VTR online by? Um, Judy, do you wanna weigh in on this or? Sure, I mean, I'd say as soon as possible and you also have to kind of back up because you have to think about how long it takes to build and make sure that it works. <laughs> and there's just a lot of time lag. So I think we need to start working on it again yesterday and make sure that it's ready in time. And then there's gonna have to be some parallel processing where we keep pers pursuing these um, first of a kind demonstrations. And then in parallel, we are testing materials for the next generation and, and components and fuels and we just, we really need all of this to, to begin now because we're in a hurry to solve the climate problem. Um, well, so Brian, I, I kind of want to, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say quickly in terms of timing, um, the cost and schedule that was provided at critical decision one was six years, but that requires high yearly funding. Um, and you know that's, that's six years for a fully funded project. I see. Um, I kind of wanted to uh, move on to a little bit. We have quite a few audience questions, so I wanted to move into a little bit of that. Um, so going a little bit back to the uh, international collaboration, there's a question about inter international collaboration with Japan on the VTR. Uh, do we know any progress on how that's working out? I guess the question is kind of vague. It says, uh, it's just kind of generally asking about international collaboration with VTR uh, with Japan. If you have any thoughts or information on that. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, I think that, you know, and again, I'm not in the position to really say, you know, kind of um, 
who we would look to first um, for international co cooperation on this issue. But you know, in terms of countries that have expressed interest, uh, my understanding is that um, Japan and the Republic of Korea have probably expressed the most, you know, highest levels of interest. Um, but again, to get back to the earlier point, they, you know, any country that wants to you know, wants to cooperate with us and wants to use this facility, first, first it has to be built. Um, and these countries would need to see true commitments on our part first. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I was under the impression that um, the, the early talks of BTR, there were um, there was some kind of information sharing with Japan and France, I believe, but um, I don't really recall much progress going from there beyond just uh, simple information sharing. Uh, we have another question. Um, this question is, could you please talk about the inconsistency of supporting initial demonstrations of advanced reactors, but not supporting the test facilities that will enable them to improve and maintain their advantage? Also, the economic value that has been generated through the ATR in terms of improving light water reactor performance, if we can hit on that as well. Um, yeah, Judy, do you want to go ahead? Yes, it is inconsistent. Um, <laughs> That there are a lot of things, unfortunately, that we do that are inconsistent. Um, I think that this, uh, the VTR to me is in a category of projects that it is difficult for um, our government to get consensus around and move forward. You wind up, um, it takes a long time, it needs a multi-year commitment. Um, it, it benefits lots of people, not just one or two entities. So. It's, um, it's one of these types of projects that it's been difficult because of the way we appropriate and the way we make decisions that's been difficult to sustain. Um, I hope that the urgency of the climate problem and the urgency of us maintaining our leadership for the purposes of being maintaining our leadership in international safety and security would be a motivator and we really do need, and I guess I will call upon um, our leadership in, in Congress and the administration to really take the lead and really exercise leadership on this thing that we need that's a public good and is good for our country and for the world. Yeah, Judy said it great. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're not a, we're not a you know, state supported nuclear industry like Russia, which is, currently has the Bohr 60 test reactor already and is building the MBIR test reactor already has, as far as I understand, agreements with four other countries uh, that wanna perform testing there as well. Um, but, but lots of uh, you know, IP and export control concerns uh, for, for that work, in particular for, for US companies. So yeah, uh, it's a tough, it's tough um, in our current appropriation model. Um, for a big project like this, but you know, we're, we're making the case for, for why it's, it's a worthwhile investment. I, see. Um, I, I am interested in this last part. Has anyone, uh, I guess, looked into um, trying to find the numeric economic value of how the ATR has improved light water reactor performance? I feel like that might be a, could be a compelling argument as well, I guess. <laughs> I guess that uh, analysis has not really been done yet. No, but it, it's a good idea. Um, and we certainly have qualitative uh, information where actual te you know, tests have really helped to, to circle back and improve performance. And, and that we have the fact that our existing nuclear set of nuclear reactors has really improved performance dramatically over the past decades. And one of the components of what made that happen was, was were the test reactors. I see. Well, I guess maybe trying to do, I guess, some sort of qual quantitative analysis could, could be quite beneficial. Uh, we do have a question about the waste, about the VTR's waste production. Um, how would the waste from the versatile test reactor different from, differ from waste produced by other test reactors of the past? And has the government considered this in its review of the VTR? Uh, Jennifer, did you want to, or Jackie? No, I can't actually speak to that. Um, I, I'm sure they're thinking about it, um, but their their internal uh, design development process is, is not public. I see. Um, well, then I guess uh, th there's another question asking about the why the VTR has to be so large as a 300 megawatt. Is that also, I guess, is that something that we can discuss or? 
Yeah, I mean, my understanding of that, and again, I should caveat this and say I'm not at all a technical person. Um, my background is in history, but um, you know, the VTR needs the specifications that it has in order to be able to essentially create like a like a time lapse simulation. Um, and so, if you want to be able to test fuels um, and materials more quickly than you would in real time. Um, it needs to have, you know, it needs to be built and run in a certain way. I see. Um, and there is, there is another question that um, I guess this question is, uh, who is the VTR's first customer or is it build it and they will come? I know we kind of discussed this idea of it that uh, we as the US have to kind of show our commitment to the VTR before other other countries or maybe even private industry can come and help. Um, but maybe I was uh, kind of hoping to discuss, maybe we can discuss about this. Uh, when If the VTR were to be funded and it were to be built, uh, would we be opening these first to domestic first or are there any thoughts as to whether we would prioritize our industry in the US or international partners outside? I'll say a little bit about this. I mean, the, the good news is that we have at the moment this sort of advantage and that we have a lot of advanced reactor developers here in the United States. And so they would naturally be among the first. There are also uh, advanced reactor developers in other countries, and I would certainly argue that they should be uh, welcome to use the facility as well. I think the, the key thing is that we have a leadership um, advantage technologically, and the question is whether we can maintain it and whether we can um, capitalize it to have that, uh, maintain that advantage and use it internationally to become a force uh, in, in terms of global markets. Uh, we see a lot of potential demand for these technologies that we could uh, meet, and we have a set of really innovative companies who are doing really exciting work who could use this and would be uh, you know, among the first in line, but I don't necessarily think you have to reserve a space for them uh, because there's a bunch of them that are already in the lead. Brian, I would just add, you know, the, the vision of the VTR, in my understanding, is to operate as a user facility available to researchers from across the advanced nuclear communities. Um, you know, basically in the way in which the ATR has provided essential infrastructure for today's light water reactor fleet. So, you know, if we're talking about U.S. industry, um, you know, much of which is already becoming sort of multinational, um, you know, in a lot of ways with our allies, um, I mean, I, I view all of that as whether it's, you know, a company from the United States, from Japan, from Korea, you know, from France, that to me is a geopolitical win if we're doing it you know, ourselves with our allies, rather than having that capability only be based as it is right now in Russia. I see. Um, well, given that we've discussed the urgency, the need of the VTR, I guess, uh, can we discuss um, uh, oppositions to VTR? Can we discuss why Congress has zeroed the budget, I guess? Uh, what, are, what are some of the oppositions in Congress? Why is the budget being zeroed? And how do we, I guess, address these concerns? Jackie, do you have any thoughts on, on we maybe? A, yeah, we don't have immediate insight into um, why the zero figure from House and Senate appropriators. Um, we, you, what you saw in the last several years um, was a, a huge groundswell of support among industry partners for the VTR. Um, I know the Nuclear Energy Institute had convened a you know advanced reactor working group. Uh, VTR was one of the concepts that they were um, you know several years ago very very vocal in support of, of the need for this um, as an as an innovative um, opportunity. Um, and you know the the push for you know sometimes industry members need to push for um, you know rank order. <laughs> Um, in support of what, what they need uh, at, at the given moment. Um, so that may be one of the factors um, in, in the rationale. Um, however, uh, you know, all of us, I think on this call, understand uh, you know, quite, quite short-sighted both of, of Congress um, and of any 
members of industry who aren't looking past the first demonstration, who aren't looking toward that, that fifth year, 10th year um, innovation uh, in fuels and sensors and materials. Um, so I guess uh, given the, it is not just the US need for the VTR, I guess it would be kind of an international need other, uh, if we didn't want to rely on Russia. So do we have any insights on how other allied countries are looking at the VTR progress right now? I understand that if we were to successfully complete the VTR, they would be you know, more than happy to come utilize it. But uh, given the current status and the lack of funding in the Congress, uh, how are other countries kind of looking at this? Are they looking at other, op other options or are they kind of crossing their fingers and waiting for this to happen? Judy, do you want to? Yeah, I, actually, I'm going to combine. I wanted to mention something about the last question as well. I don't think that what we're seeing is opposition to the VTR. I, I may be wrong, but that's not what I've detected. It, it's been more like insufficient support. And I think that we in the NGO community, I, you know, we're, we're trying, but we probably need to do a better job of making the case and we need more champions. I, I think that's the... Um, I don't think it's that people think it's a bad idea. I think it's just um, competes with a lot of other things. And it's, it's got this characteristics that I, may, I mentioned earlier where you need a substantial investment over many years and you have to sustain it. And that's just difficult in our process. Um, I think the strength of the US innovation ecosystem is maybe not as, um, well understood as it ought to be. So in the context of like the Russian um, innovation ecosystem where it's state owned enterprises, there's sort of this um, a set of state owned activities and state owned businesses and that, that's how uh, they do their work. For us, we have this mix of private and public action. And the VTR is a component that needs this public, big public investment. And then we have this very robust private sector set of investments and activities that's really a strength. And I think that's why a lot of other countries are sort of naturally looking to us because we have this um, pretty strong um, or unusually strong uh, set of advanced reactor developers who are privately owned. One would think that it would be here that you'd be sort of ahead of the curve. But there are other countries where there's really exciting things going on. And it could be that if we fail to um, you know, meet the, the timing that's essential, maybe other countries will step up. Um, but I think that a lot of people would sort of assume that of course we would step up because this is an exciting arena of innovation for us. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it goes, but certainly we would like to push as hard as possible for the US to take a real leadership role and bring along other partners uh, among our allies. And for concerned parties, it's really important to, to iterate here that you know the, the appropriations process for fiscal year 22 is, is still ongoing. The project is still uh, you know underway. It hasn't paused um, or anything. So um, you know the, the reconciliation package in, in the US Congress hasn't uh, yet been decided. Um, so negotiations are, are still underway. So I see. Um. Yeah, I guess uh, given that the given that everyone kind of needs this VTR, I mean, I, before I ask a question, do, are we aware of any, I guess, similar VTR type projects in other countries, or are any other countries kind of thinking about a similar uh, test facility for? Because it seems to me that uh, I guess if if the VTR is going to be so important in uh, the future of the advanced reactors, uh, not just in the U.S. but also uh, with the U.S. as allies. Uh, this idea of kind of waiting for the U.S. to fund and support the VTR and then having people come in might be, I guess, somewhat problematic. Uh, are there any options for us to, I guess, pursue, um, I guess, more explicit additional support from the private industry or international partners? So Brian, I think something, you know, really crucial to understand here is that if you look at oh. certainly you know, our civil nuclear allies, no one else has the level of advanced reactors, you know, in design that we have in the United States. 
so we have like just a totally different community an advanced reactor community here, um, which I think is also why there's so much focus on needing the VTR capability here as well. Um, we, we do have a, a con uh, in the chat, um, the FY 2021 Appropriations Act on the VTR does kind of, uh, it, it does seem to kind of uh, explicitly mention some pro public private partnership with an option for a payment for a milestones approach. Is this something that we can kind of elaborate on a little bit? So certainly, um, Are there in yeah, on the um, on the milestones approach, that's definitely something that NIA supports, and that's really a contracting mechanism where you actually make uh, contracting payments from the government to a private entity contingent on their performance, which makes a lot of sense. So incorporating a pay perform pay for performance type of approach in the VTR could definitely work, as as it um, could work in a lot of other aspects of um, our funding, our energy and innovation funding in the US. We certainly, whatever we do um, with VTR, we wanna make sure that the contract management is state of the art, that um, there are incentives in place for um, it to be done well, uh, high quality, uh, fast. And we really do wanna make sure that whatever happens um, with VTR, it's, it's the best possible facility under a, a reasonable as, and quick as possible time frame. Um, so I think that though all those uh, options are, are very important. And the way that it's going to work with ETR is there will, of course, be private entities involved. Um, it's the government, though, is, is footing um, the majority of the bill to get it built. And that, as I mentioned earlier, makes sense because it's going to benefit a lot of um, different entities. Uh, before we wrap up this webinar, I kind of wanted to ask a one final question to all the speakers. Maybe we can go in the order of our introductory remarks. Um, I kind of wanted to ask, what are what are the next steps of the VTR? You know, what do you hope to see in terms of action from the nuclear industry? Uh, and basically, what can we do to speed this up? Uh, Jackie, you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Um, what's next? Um, fingers crossed for a... Uh propitious <laughs> uh, funding support uh, from, from Congress for, for fiscal 22 and or uh, through reconciliation. Um, in part for that to happen, uh, we still need to you know, continue to beat the drum, all of us in the, um, the public sector, um, all of us in industry uh, for why this is, this is a worthwhile investment uh, to make, uh, one that we're going to ultimately uh, recoup costs on both directly uh, through um, potential uh, assessment of user fees, but also through, you know, the health benefits, uh, the exports that we get from uh, from uh, an ad strong domestic advanced reactor um, industry. Um, so this is what we're hoping to see. Things are moving forward, engineering and design work, um, but we need that that funding to uh, make sure we we stay on target. Thank you, uh, Judy. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful that um, either through uh, these various uh, processes that are going on in Congress now, whether it's the reconciliation process or FY22 appropriations, that we will see um, funding for this important project. And I think the whole nuclear ecosystem needs to uh, push for that. And hopefully we will, and hopefully um, the federal government will step up and um, adequately fund this. I certainly think that there, because there is, there are these other projects going on, making sure that we take full advantage of everything we're learning across the innovation ecosystem is taken into account as we proceed on the VTR and we make sure that we incorporate lessons learned from the whole system. Um, there's, there's gonna be a big push for more and more innovation, and we want to make sure that this is a an adequate component of it, and also that all of these different components of our system learn from one another and make sure that we are optimizing across all these programs. And Jennifer? Thanks, Brian. 
So speaking personally, you know, what I hope to see, of course, is full funding um, for this program. And I would say too, just, you know, greater investment um, in, in nuclear energy innovation more broadly. Um, and, and I also hope for greater understanding, um, again, on the part of our policymakers, our decision makers, our leaders, number one, understanding the need for nuclear energy innovation for climate and the need for nuclear energy innovation for US global leadership along with our allies. Um, my hope is that in a year from now, we're not back here having the same conversation. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, I hope for the same thing as well. <laughs> um, thank you for all of your remarks. Um, I'm really hoping that you know all of these ideas, we can somehow package this and uh, deliver this to Congress in a way where we can find you know more support, more financial support to see this uh, VTR project go through. Um, thank you again for all the attendees as well for uh, being and participating in this webinar. Your questions were quite valuable into the discussion. Um, well, yeah, thank you to everyone. Thank you to speakers and participants and uh, had a great discussion and hope to see you in the future. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate it.